We're going to be in Hebrews again tonight, in the 12th chapter. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12. Still here, pages turning. Wherefore, seeing we are uh, compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, and you like that? Amen. What uh, book have you got, Judy? You say the same thing? No, it's a little bit different. We got a mic over here. Mm, good. John can tell you to hang on to it. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with the perseverance the race marked out for us. Run with what? Perseverance? Perseverance. And the sin which so easily beset us. What kind of sin does so easily beset us? Is it specific or is it in general? Uh, Chuck says it varies from person to person. But it comes from one thing. <coughs> it's a transgression of the law. And uh, the law, believe it or not, is the book. But the there's the, the Old Testament and the New Testament law. And what a difference. But the Old Testament law is a schoolmaster. And uh, we, we get a look at God's heart, God's desire, and His will. But when we're turned loose to do it in the way we want to, Let's read that first verse again. Yeah, sure. You got a mic. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Well, let's deal first. Uh, I have a little problem with these mics, and that's not a mic. But when it's in my hand, it winds up in my mouth. <laughs> Let's deal with uh, the basic law of commandments that, that God gave Moses. Uh, we won't go into the whole story about... Uh, how that the first set of the first laws were broken, and uh, and all the, the the circumstances about the mountain that they were on, and uh, the dark clouds, and the, uh, the noise, and what have you. Let's just deal with uh, the Ten Commandments. What do we need to go to Deuteronomy chapter five? Well, you got Deuteronomy chapter 5 or Exodus 20, either one. I kind of like Deuteronomy 5. Yeah, it does. I just like it. Uh, 
See, I'm not sure what verse we start with. Along about the fifth or something like that. Huh? Seventh. Seventh. You want to start reading the seventh, Judy? Now that's uh, uh, that one. You can't really play with it. Amen. It's the way he wants it, the way he likes it. But if you don't, you know, there's other consequences and other things that uh, are going to happen. You shall have no other god before me. Amen? Amen. Number one. What's the next one? You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in the heavens above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me. Now, I don't know what all, uh, what all uh, these images amount to, but uh, uh, whenever you uh, uh, fill your house with certain idols and certain things, certain other symbols, what have you, that do not glorify God, uh, then you've got a problem. Amen? Pictures that uh, show other things. It's, uh, the house is to be, I don't know how many times I'm going to say this in my lifetime. I hope it's many more times. The house is to be most holy. Holy, does everybody know what holy means? The definition of holy? Set apart for God, dedicated and committed. And so all your thoughts and all your actions are to be centered on His presence and His uh, instructions about what He likes and what He don't like. Amen? What's your next one? Verse 11, You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, nor the Lord will, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses His name. You mean something like, God damn it, or gall darn it, or something like that? Well, that that's one of them. All right. What's another way? Um, I think it also means misrepresenting the nature of God. Right. You're putting your own name or your own nature up. This is the way I believe it. It's the way I think it is. Amen? Instead of giving God the glory, this is what God said it is. This is how it is according to God's word. Yeah. It's okay. What's the next one? Verse 12, observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. As the Lord your God has commanded you, six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son nor your daughter nor your manservant or your maidservant nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals nor the alien within your gates, so that your manservant and maidservant may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. What does Sabbath mean? Rest, rest doesn't it? Well, I found out as I began to you know, get into the world, begin to work, run my business, what have you. I needed a day of rest. I really did. I worked six days, and boy, that seventh one was tough. While I was with my dad, my natural dad, coming out of high school and working for him on his car lot, we went from eight in the morning till nine o'clock at night, and we did it six days. And the seventh day, 
We went from 9 o'clock in the morning to 5 o'clock in the afternoon. We worked seven days a week. Did it for almost 10 years. You think I don't have a problem with long hours? <laughs> <coughs> and later in life, whenever I had my business, uh, and I would go to the YMCA at noon and usually work out a little bit or get with those tall guys to play a little basketball and get knocked around, you know. I was five foot seven and a half, and there wasn't anybody up there that short. But uh, I need rest. You need rest. What I found out, uh, you can just take this, put it in your satchel, your purse, your pocket, or wherever you want to put it. Under the new covenant, I'm pretty convinced it doesn't matter if it's Saturday or if it's Sunday or if it's Monday or if it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. If it's such that your job or where you work or where your business and you need to take Saturday as a Sabbath, that's fine. It's not a problem. Because Sabbath is a day of rest. And in the New Covenant, you're to be able to rest in Him every day. Hello. Amen. Every day. You rest in Him. In other words, you don't take on the world and all the problems. You don't take on all... Somebody else's problems, you don't take on all your problems. You rest in Him. And uh, I found it worked. And so my Sunday was taken up with church. Hello? Somebody say something? Hmm. What's the next one? Boy, in this day and age, there is less respect in families for the father and mother that I've ever seen. It's terrible, isn't it? But he gives a promise with it that it may be what? Well with you? You'll live a long life. You won't live a long life? Honor your father and your mother. Now, in, in the New Covenant, uh, the church is your father and church is your mother. Respect it, honor it, tithe. Uh, when the doors are open, do your best to be there. Uh, accept the Word of God for what He's teaching you and practice what He's teaching. Amen? Amen. And so uh, a lot of families, uh, I know in my situation, my, my dad and mother were divorced. I was about uh, 13 or 14 when it took place. And uh, uh, over the years, and the way that things went with both of them, I had not much respect. I couldn't handle that one. But uh, uh, later, when I when I had my experience with Christ, and and found out the new covenant has a whole lot different look at that, I was able to keep the commandment. Amen? I don't know whether anybody else has got a different take on that. If you have, you know, in this place you can raise your hand and you got the floor. Or just look at me crossways and you got the floor. What? Oh. That's everybody but Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think, I don't think I have a different take on it. I think, uh, I think uh, it's really what you meant to say is, is, Honoring God as our Father yes. and the church as our mother. As our mother. Yeah. And uh, I, I still believe we need to honor our natural mm -hmm. father, natural mother, mm -hmm. of course, and that and Christ helps you do that. But the, the, the spiritual aspect is that the church is our mother. I learned. God is our Father. God is our Father. Uh, in other words, you need to be conscious of it, and it should be in your mind as one of the things that pleases God instead of displeasing God. Amen. I remember uh, 
Of course, it's been a lot of years ago, but we'd been at that uh, location on 11th Street uh, for quite a while, and the, uh, the advertising guy wanted me to run a special with with the with the three sons, my myself, my father, and my and and Jeff. And uh, so we did. We put a big Sunday ad in, and had Dad come down. They took the pictures and everything. Uh, the business and how it started with Dad. Oh, we still got the picture. Okay. So, and uh, even though he got pretty ornery uh, when he went through this second, third, third divorce, he was in his 80s, wasn't he? Yeah. And he got pretty ornery, and, and I had some problems with him, but, but by that time, uh, I just overlooked him. Just went right on and did what I was supposed to do and went there when I was supposed to and I sometimes couldn't stay very long. <laughs> He's griping. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I loved him. He was my natural father. And I made sure I did, okay? I overlooked everything else. Pretty well what God does. What's our next one, sis? Oh, come on. Doggone it. I got a person or two I'd kind of like to get rid of. Speaks for itself. I don't have to do anything with that one. Thou shall not murder. And, of course, uh, what you see on TV with the ISIS bunch and uh, they're cutting off heads and what have you, uh, I can't imagine what they will go through in the other realm. Amen. I just can't imagine it. But uh, uh, I don't know how long. I don't know. I still, I still don't know enough about God to know how much He will forgive, and for how long, and when. I gotta assume He'll forgive it all certain situations, certain times, but some of it I think he'll retain for a certain time. The reason I think that is because of we preach, and when we preach or teach, we preach to that realm, the unseen realm. Why would we do that if there wasn't, if they weren't able to get a hold of the message? Amen? Uh, What's the next one, dear? The seventh commandment is in verse 18. You shall not commit adultery. Well, it's best if you don't do that. Uh, Any time that you get involved with another person like that, uh, and you may think it's all right, but God says no, it's not all right. And so it's something we have to be conscious of and around in our family and what have you. And I preach and teach, no, don't do that. It is a sin. And sin has consequences and cost, sometimes big time. Next one. I wonder if if I cheat somebody in business, is that stealing? Yep. Uh oh, I think you're right. I think it is. Say that again. If you are at work, Paul, that's stealing. That is stealing. Amen. I agree. Okay, next one. Verse 9, I uh, know, verse 20, this is the ninth commandment. Ye shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Uh, one of the things that 
that really, really God doesn't like is how you treat your neighbor and how you think about your neighbor. You're to love your neighbor as what? As yourself. You know, that ain't that easy to do. But that's the way he looks at it. And that's the way he wants it done. Respect your neighbor. Honor your neighbor. Well, praise God. Amen. And the next one, the 10th one. Verse 21, the 10th commandment. Ye shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Ye shall not set your desire on your neighbor's house or land. His manservant or his maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Or his car. <laughs> Amen. Or his money. If you're going to treat your neighbor as yourself, you're going to you're going to pray that he prospers and not loses. Amen. Amen. And you you you'll expect him to prosper better than you do. And uh, I don't want anything that doesn't belong to me from a neighbor or from a business associate or anything else. Amen. And I used to didn't think quite like that. I had a mixture in my thinking. But God straightened me out and let me know that these Ten Commandments uh, are how He feels about it and how He thinks about it. And they're still in effect, even though you're under grace. Amen? <clears throat> okay, so that, that ends the, the sin factor specifically. Now, there's a lot of other sins, I'm sure, that we could probably get into. But if you follow these and make sure that you're honoring them and honoring God in them, you don't really have to worry about anything else. Amen? This will get it done. It's the schoolmaster. It teaches you how to think and how to act and how to do things. All right, now we're still in the same chapter, and they're still in the same verse, aren't we? Hebrews 1. It said that the uh, sins that which the Seth doth so easily beset us, and, uh, and uh, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. How many of you have heard messages on race? On the race. Have you got it figured out? You know what it means? Hmm? Well, a race, you can look at a race a lot of ways. You can be in a competition trying to win a race or you can be in a in a where you're being developed in a certain aspect of God's righteousness and you're walking it out or talking it out and you're it's like a race in that sense not that you want to win it you want to finish it amen, amen. and uh You'd like to win it. But you need to finish it. <laughs> Billy finishes and he wins. And he likes to win. Uh, right here. This is number 73. This is the uh, Greek word. That trans translates as race. It's right there. Would you read it? Number 73. Looks like, looks like Aegon. Aegon. A place of assembly as if led. Wait a minute. That would be like church, wouldn't it? A contest held there by That's implication. Well, in other words, when God preaches and teaches his laws and what's, what he likes and what he don't like, that's the place you can get it, right? And then it's got a uh, figure, I guess. It's F-I-G period. And effort or anxiety. 
effort or anxiety. Conflict, contention, fight, or race. Conflict, contention, or race. Conflict or contention. So there's several different meanings to the Greek word. If we had the time, which we don't, uh, is it pertinent? Well, all right, let's get it. We're not going nowhere. You ain't hurt nothing. That word goes up and down a few different places there. Uh, what she just said, you know, ending with the struggle, it's to compete for a prize, right. which is what Paul refers to. Right. Also, this race, uh, it says to contend with an adversary, to endeavor to accomplish something, to lead by implying to bring or drive, specifically past time, and this is where the pertinent thing is, it says bringing up, that is, mode of living, manner of life. And then it translates back to 71, where it originates from, and it says a field as a drive for cattle. And then if you think about the song, give us this day our daily bread, lead us to pastures where we may be fed, But it's not like you're running in a race. Nope. Doesn't mean that. And you're, not in competition with one another and you're not in competition with each other. Hello. I don't know exactly how to say it, but there's one thing I've found out about God's nature and character is he wants everyone to compete. He wants everyone to run this race. And uh, the object is that we might apprehend that that we've been apprehended for. In this case, it's kings, priests, ministers, and uh, in one place in the book, and I didn't look it up so we could research it and go back and look at it, but it does say in the book that the preacher or the teacher or the prophet standing up here is not as important as the people that are standing and sitting out here. And so when I studied that, when I did look at it a long time ago, I got the idea that it's real easy for these ministers to get on a pedestal and begin to think in terms that they know more than everybody else. Amen? And that's a real, real easy thing to do. Knowledge does what? Puffs up. When there's no love there, when it's just simply something that you're doing, you know, for your own self or where you think you're doing God's service. So anyway, it's not running a race. It's not a competition, but you are in a race. <laughs> yeah. Well, he is using a natural race for a illustration. And... Uh, we are competing against one thing, and that is the natural affections of the uh, of the flesh. And so, and all the conflict, when you're in a race, you are in a conflict because you're trying to win where the other guy's trying to win too. And what we're in a race with is that natural man that's, those natural desires is try, that's trying to get our affection. And so... Uh, Absolutely, that's the adversary. <laughs> Who's the adversary? The natural man. Amen. 
natural humanity. You do away with the sin part of it, and what happens? Race gets a lot easier. Yeah. And, and, and to reach out to apprehend that which you've been apprehended for is one thing that Paul did. Now, there was a lot said that wasn't said when Paul said, uh, I, I put those things behind me and, and I'm reaching out for those things that are before me, the prize of the high calling of God. There was a whole lot said that wasn't said. He was in a race and he knew it. Amen. And that all of his knowledge, all of his IQ, and all of his... Uh, uh, part of his life beforehand, when it came to godliness, it meant nothing. However, God used it. He uses everything he's got. But, uh, and he did bring Paul before uh, magistrates and kings and, and Brought him into Rome and everything else, and he, he he had him as an example, and he had him as one that would bring the gospel out of the Jews into the world or into the nations. I don't know where we're all headed, but I'm telling you, we're still in this race. Amen. This race isn't over. There's a lot of things I don't know. A lot of things I haven't apprehended. And uh, <laughs> back to the beginning. In the beginning. Well, here's what I like. Uh, Jesus, and as far as I'm concerned, Jesus is and was the Word. And he still is the Word. And in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. Do what? Run it by me again. In the beginning was the Word, was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus wasn't out of any of it. until he was born of a woman and came into the earth with a natural physical body so that he could really fully understand his creation, I believe. Amen? Amen? But, then he, but then he wasn't completely out of it then because there was no sin in him to separate himself from his real identity until... Our sins were laid upon him, and he was forsaken of God, and there was turned into a complete man. So he could die. I was studying one time when they were at the marriage supper, and they ran out of wine. And... Uh, uh, Jesus, uh, her Jesus's mother, Mary, she went to Jesus and said, "They've they're out of wine." And he said, uh, "Woman, what have I to do with thee? It's not my time yet. I don't believe that's anywhere near close to the right translation." When I looked it up and began to study the words, and I didn't go into an in-depth, long hours and hours and hours of it, but the word he used, mother or woman, was a, was a tender word. It was like mother. What do you want me to do? You think it's my time? And uh, I assumed that I would know my time when it was ready. 
she turned from him and said to the servants, whatever he, he says. You do it. And I think that's the way it is today. What he says, that's what we got to do. Amen. And he said, fill up the pots with water. Bear it out to the governor of the feast. The governor of the feast took one sip and said, well, you save the good wine until last. He knew who he was. He knew even then that he was to be the Savior of the world and that he would have to face the cross. Now, the race we're running, the race we're in, there definitely is a crucified life involved. Our natural life doesn't have anything to do with this. Amen? This is all God. And it's all about Him. We're a habitation, we're a dwelling place for His Spirit and His Word. And uh, He wants us to understand everything. And He wants to reveal Himself in everything. Believe me, He does. Amen? Amen. But it, 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 it works out little by little, here a little and there a little. Is the way it has to work out. Amen. Amen. Is it what? Ten minutes after nine. Uh, where are we at in the chapter? We. Uh, I don't think there's anything more on the race. Um, we're in verse. We're in verse two. Well, read uh, read two. One of you. I don't care which. Looking unto Jesus, the author, author and, and finisher, finisher of our faith, of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, the joy, endured the cross, the joy, despising the shame, and is set down at the right, right hand, hand of, of God, God, right hand of the throne, the throne of, of God. God. See, there's our goal. There's our goal. Amen. You got anything you want to add? Because I'm going to close it. No. Is it okay if I close it? Well, yeah. Oh, the order? Did you look the word up? No, I haven't. Uh, I did. Okay, well, let's let you enlighten us. I think it goes along with the race. Uh, probably so. But I like how it how it words it in the beginning. It says a regular arrangement it's normal it's normal and this is coming from Hebrews 5 6 when it starts talking about the order of Melchizedek it says a regular arrangement that is in time fixed succession of rank or character official dignity to arrange in an orderly manner that is assign or dispose to certain position or lot appoint ordain Don't be afraid of the race. And don't look at it as, as more difficult than you can do. You're in the race when you're in daily life, when you're living life. See, he that hath the Son hath life. It's not after we get to heaven sometime and we got life. We have life now, so we have heaven in us now, working in us. So you don't have to be afraid of life. Or the race. And uh, basically, if you draw a bottom line to it, it's knowledge. Knowledge with understanding. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Still working on faith. Amen? Okay, God bless. Just about to run out of voice. Yeah, Doc.